What's up, trade crew? Welcome back to HVAC R&D, hosted by Ryden and Atzenhofer. Tonight, I have a power duo of brothers that have found a way to build an HVAC business together in the mountains of North Carolina. So, let's get it going. Yeah, come on. This episode of HVAC R&D is brought to you by Bosch Home Comfort and Global The Source. As the newest segment sponsor of the show, there's lots of content to come your way from Bosch Home Comfort featuring their IDS light inverter ducted split systems, gas furnaces, Climate 5000 mini splits, and the excellent dealer program package available to Bosch Home Comfort pros. Make sure to check the link in the vendor hub to learn more about HVAC's best bang for the buck in your market. The show's newest Vendor Hub partner, Global The Source, can also be found in the Vendor Hub. And if you're looking for training on any and all of their products, from the industry-changing AMRAD Turbo Series of Capacitors to their universal hard start kits and hung right mounting systems, you can click the link in the HVAC R&D Vendor Hub and request training with your local or regional sales representative at any time. The show is also looking for the next HVAC R&D Power Buy sponsor. If you're interested, please reach out via the contact link on HVACR&D.com. Or you can drop me a line at hvacrd at gmail.com and I will send you the 2024 press kit. I'm also grateful to continue to be part of the 2024 AHR Expo Workforce Development Team that has been working with Chicago's Prosser Career Academy and High School, a local high school with a dedicated HVAC program helping to bring the next group of trades people to the industry. Huge continued thank yous to Bosch Home Comfort, Insight Partners, and the Moore Sales Corporation. I could not be happier to have such dedicated partners on board for this project. And if you're interested in helping with the school and the rest of the team, please reach out and let me know. If this is your first time listening to the show, I welcome you. Thank you for giving R&D a shot. I am based in North Carolina, and the show is focused on research and development within the trades. The main objective is the pursuit of building a better, more knowledgeable community of HVAC professionals and fellow tradespeople by learning from the past and embracing new advances in the industry to help us all be better for the future. If you're not following the show online, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok as HVAC.R&D, as well as on LinkedIn, Trade Hounds, and Facebook as the HVAC R&D Podcast. If you're not listening to each and every week's show and you found me on your favorite streaming platform, whether it be Apple, iHeart, Pandora, Spotify, or one of any other platforms, please follow the show, like and rate an episode, leave me a review, share me with your trade crew. If you don't work with me, you know how to do that. And also make sure to visit the website, check out the swag shop, and join the mailing list at the bottom of the page. So tonight, I'd like to introduce you to the Haskells. I'm joined by two brothers who've built a successful HVAC business together. Both Crawford and Wyatt have formed Haskell Heating and Air, and they have a unique story having started their journey in the high country of North Carolina. They become great friends of the show and are also great customer partners with Insight and myself. They are registered Bosch Home Comfort Pros, and I'm excited to dive into their story, their partnership, and how they've grown their business in the competitive HVAC market. So trade crew, please welcome Crawford and Wyatt Haskell to the show. Thanks for having us, Ron. What's up, guys? Thank you. So, you guys have heard this show enough. You know how it starts. So what are we drinking, fellas? Well, I've got a green tea with some lemon zest. <laughs> and I also have a twisted tea rocket pop from the 4th of July. There you go. Yeah, I'm working with the uh, coconut water here. So... You know, 
getting turned today. How about you? So I'm drinking an outlaw again, so I will I will cheers this from the get go. Welcome to the show. Glad you guys are here. It's one we've talked about, but hadn't had a chance to have y'all on here yet, so it's about time. Yeah, we're glad to be here. Thank you. Um, so the interesting part is you guys are definitely not from North Carolina. So Crawford, I know you kind of got up here first. So so what even really you know, kind of motivated you to move to, you know, the high country area, which is really upper western North Carolina. So, a uh, former relationship had their family lived up here for years, and it was like a summer vacation place, and um, they'd been looking to get a job in the area, and they got one, and at the time, I'd been working kind of in the oil industry, and... Um, it wasn't really tied down anywhere, so I wanted to come experience it. And then when I did, uh, I liked the place enough that pretty much within a week, I decided I'm definitely going to be moving up here too. And then kind of got into construction and, and stuck around. I, I enjoyed the place a lot. Now, did you get, like you said, you got into construction first. How did you, how did you end up even getting into HVAC? It was like a kind of a, a long like road of it i getting into construction i walked down to a neighbor's house and just asked them if they needed help with something because i could hear them uh messing with their deck and then they got me a job somewhere else and in that industry i started trying to kind of get into a more focused part of the trade we were just doing just about everything involving like house building yep. and i have some family members and some friends who had been encouraging me for a long time to try uh, HVAC out and a job came open and you know I called those same people up and they were like yeah do it for real you're gonna like it and then pretty much day one I knew that this was a good choice for me how long were you kind of on you know getting into the HVAC journey before you roped wide into coming up here I was right at probably only a year and a half and what made the move make sense to you why it was a were you kind of on the same thought? Do you kind of have some of the same job thoughts or hobbies, or was this kind of a complete change for you too? I mean, I, I had never worked in the HVAC industry before, and I figured if you know Bubba could do it, I could do it too. Uh, that's also <laughs> that's what I call him, is Bubba. I know James Crawford, <laughs> but that's what our family calls him. But yeah, so I was I was going to school for uh, for business down in South Florida, and I was getting ready to graduate, and uh, let's see, we had always wanted to start a business together at some point. Um, we had a lot of ideas growing up and he just called me up one day and he was like pretty excited about it. And he was like, dude, this HVAC industry, I'm actually getting it. It's pretty intuitive. And, uh, it seems like we can make a lot of money. And I was like, that sounds great. I'll move right up. And so I graduated, um, in like the summer of 2020 and I don't think there was a better time to start a business than 2020. And so <laughs> we I moved yeah. up here and uh, we started working together at a local company. And um, I pretty much just learned under him. I had taken a couple HVAC courses at, at my local community college, um, mostly for like yacht systems. And uh, honestly, nothing really prepared us um, or prepared me better than just like working in the field, you know, getting that hands-on knowledge, especially with uh, my brother who I felt was really technically proficient and he was able to explain a lot of things to me early on. So I didn't make the same mistakes that he made when he first got started. So honestly, that that was pretty much it. I mean, once we got up here, we kind of got rolling. We got, we already had some side jobs working and, um, you know, we took a brief halt because, uh, you know, business had slowed down a bit because of COVID. But yep. once once I moved back to the area about a year later, we really got going and um, we kind of went full throttle with it. Now, when did you guys first, when did you first open your doors as Haskell Heating and Air? Uh, July uh, 2021. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, I got, well, I got licensed in June okay. and then I think at the end of June, I had done like, you know, made an LLC and gotcha. then when I talked to my brother and uh, his wife, Natalie, 
it was, it was like a month or two later they actually moved back up here like because we we were like all right let's let's see if we can make this work let's do it so i wasn't i once i finally got licensed and i could do everything legit that's when we jumped in and and pretty much uh, that became his full-time job at that point yeah it was uh july 18th was the day that we actually moved up here and we took one vacation and we were like i don't think we're gonna take another vacation for a while because all of us were starting like my wife natalie she was starting a real estate career and we were doing this this hvac business and we knew that it would take a lot of work a lot of a lot of time really and i remember just sitting there on his deck on, on bubba's deck and we were like this might be like the last time that we have like a real vacation and then it hit august and that's when we got our first client and then you know we kind of just uh continued to grow from there and by december of that year um bubba was able to quit his job full time and uh yeah come on to the business and i kind of just started right away i was like man my, my expenses are small we can live together you know let's let's really give this thing uh, give this thing a shot so really you kind of you kind of jumped in why you kind of jumped in and took your your business education you know and immediately used that to kind of start laying the groundwork while while Wyatt was, or excuse me, while Crawford was trying to kind of just start going out and build sales and try to build a client base. Yeah, exactly, man. I just kind of um, got a scope of like what was required on the back end of things. Like, you know, what kind of, what, what do we need to do for permits? Like, that's yep. something that, you know, your, your normal employer doesn't really explain to you. Um, for an HVAC job, if you're just a technician, it's like, okay, we got to go to the county. It's like, okay, what, what forms do we need? What kind of insurance do we need? Do we really need workman's comp right now since it's just us working? Um, what can we do to kind of save expenses and get our name out there? And so like, we didn't have obviously the friends and the, the family resources mm -hmm. in the area since we were so new up here. So I figured, you know, what's the, what's the next best thing is like getting our name out on social media, on Google, having some established credibility with a new website and really getting those people that are kind of new to the area too, since I don't know if you know, but like so many people moved up here during the pandemic, I'm sure in your area, oh, yeah. too, but it was like crazy, the migration, my, myself included, you know, and, um, it's just like a lot of people wanted to get away from the city and come live where we are. And uh, so for those people, we were kind of, you know, we were equivalent online, even though we didn't have like that real, like, you know, the, the roots established yet. I saw kind of the same thing, same kind of migration. You know, I'm from, I'm from the mountains, not your part of the mountains, but you know, having grown up in Bryson city in a small town, like over the last couple of years, it's been just crazy amounts of people have moved into that area. Um, compared to the way it was when I grew up there. So you're, you're seeing there's more heating and air businesses up there now than, than you can shake a stick at versus the way it was, you know, 25 years ago when I was growing up in the field and, you know, you, you bring up social media and really kind of the first, the first way that the three of us connected really, I guess to say the four of us um, was that you guys heard the podcast. And I think you had been in, I think you had heard me and Dennis talk through the show. And then I think you had had a training with him at a different distributor at some point. Oh, I, I had a technical issue and okay. called up Dennis. And then uh, right after that, I got the whole company to go do a training with him. Yep. And then, uh, and then he was like, you gotta, you gotta be right on too, because um, he does a podcast with me and he is also selling these products we're learning about. So we gotta, we gotta get this thing full circle. And I think we could, you were in contact with us about a week after that class. Yep. I think so. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where, where our relationship really all started and, and talking about that, you know, you know, how has, how has social media changed how you looked at making business partnership decisions in the last couple of years, you know, seeing kind of how it affects your business, both on the B2B side, but also the B2C side with your customers. Yeah, I'd say like on social media, um, it's something that can be a useful tool for establishing credibility and trust with people that you actually don't know or interact with on a daily yep. basis. So that way, you know, people can see our work. We like to show pictures of our installations. We like to show pictures of our team. 
um we like to show pictures of us catching big fish you know try try and be like relatable and also show like we we can get the job done right and so i think something that also really helps in conjunction with the social media is also like our google review page it's like something that's so um reliable for me you know as a consumer seeing google reviews seeing people actually like a place and appreciate the service or appreciate the product um it's something that makes me want to go somewhere so like we we essentially like first thing was like let's get on google let's get some reviews um let's get on instagram show our work let's get a website so that we can funnel people to our website see what we do and then everything leads to a contact page and then that contact page is you know sales and it's just um really open the open the market up to us for a market that used to be run on sort of like the good old boy system where it's like you know somebody yep. and then they know somebody and thankfully you know we're starting to tap into that because we've been around here for you know four years now where we're actually starting to get referrals or we're getting work from people that we installed for a couple of years back they're like hey i actually want a mini split in this part of my house or i'm building an addition or whatever it, it may be um but yeah social media has been something that like and and the internet the internet in general has been something that has elevated our business to the point where we can like reliably get I don't know, anywhere from one, one to four solid leads a week. And, you know, for, for a new company that's starting out, that's pretty substantial. No, that's very substantial. Yeah. And especially if it's like organic, meaning like yep. we don't have to, it, it, it's like an evergreen strategy. So like the amount of work that we put into it, it will keep on producing these leads pretty reliably every yep. week or so. As long as you continue, you know, as long as you continue the process and keep, right. keep sowing the seeds, they'll continue right. to grow. So kind of, kind of talking about, about that, we've, some of these questions that we've got in here to look at, we've kind of started to answer, but you know, obviously both of you guys started, you started working for a different company and, you know, Crawford, I'll start with you first since you kind of started, started that first. What were some of the most important lessons that you learned while, you know, doing, I'll call it an apprenticeship for lack of a better term. Um, but you know, what were some of the most important lessons you learned, you know, to be prepared for starting your own business that you kind of witnessed while you were with another company? Yeah, I think, um, it really came down to, I never really got past the level of technician. So I was just, I just really had to observe a lot of things that were going on, but I worked for both a big kind of corporate style outfit. And then also, uh, later was a service tech for a smaller family run business. And so I got to see, you know, some of the positives of the corporate stuff is there's a lot of structure there. Um, there's a lot of things going on for employees that, that can be good. Like they, they have benefit structures that are pretty solid. Um, they have like these well-oiled like funnels for bringing in clients and then just a lot of process and a lot of uh, leverage from the accounts that they have. Like I noticed they were getting products for really good prices. And then if they wanted to switch products, then somebody would already know, like I better come with the right price for this guy. Cause he's used to getting like, you know, this really good deal. And then on the family side, the, the smaller business, like they had a curated approach for everybody. And, uh, that personable kind of interaction, sometimes the corporate machine can, can kind of almost dehumanize the process when everything is just like an email that looks prefabricated. I agree with that. Yeah. And then, you know, I also got to see some of the negatives. Like I saw that family business, they worked really hard and, um, all that dedication stuff really showed, but it, it seemed like they were very stressed out because maybe they weren't as dialed in on what a good corporate process and pricing looks like. And then on the corporate side, you know, sometimes your, uh, your salesman or whoever thought up this job was just kind of relying on you to get it done and the amount of time that they could actually focus on anything seemed pretty slim from like leadership so we're, we're i guess we're kind of trying to take the best of both worlds as best as we can and like curate something but also have like a solid business foundation process no and i think i think that's the best way that, that you can do it is you've got to have you have to have that that big I hate black. I guess it's, you have to have that big company feel in terms of they want to feel that you're organized, you have processes in place, and you're large enough to take care of them. But you can't 
you can't lose that human element element of what you guys are as a service provider. And I think that's that's kind of the disconnect that you see like most of the time like you said the the smaller family run business usually seems to have that more down home feel while the corporate one has the professionalism but it's hard to find the middle ground between the two and I feel like that's where you guys are really trying to to hone in on because that gives you that truly does give you those best of both worlds. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, I I'm really lucky that I have like a lot of these people I think a, a lot of early start out businesses, you know, you can maybe buy a business that already exists, but a lot of them are like really good service tech or maybe a salesman or something. And they don't necessarily have like a trained business professional to guide them every step of the way. So that's where like my brother comes in. Well, and a lot of times they end up guys will create their own job. You know, I've throw, throw my poor father under the bus all the time on here, but dad, dad was an amazing technician still is, but there was, a lot of things when he was building his business that he just kind of had to learn it the hard way because he didn't he didn't have that background were, were you there along for the ride while he was building this business like did you see it grow from the ground up not from the ground up because he started it in 77 so i wasn't born until 86 so you know the first 20 years of it you know there was really no no me to to talk about it you know, even though I was running install crews when I was 12, 13, 14, there was still, you know, a lot of stuff I didn't understand or didn't see or wasn't a part of. It wasn't until really I got into my last couple of years of high school that I was doing, you know, more kind of client facing stuff. And then once I was in college is when I really started helping with the business side of things more. But it was kind of just I figured it out as I as I knew it before I was even really in business school because initially I went to college to be a history major thinking I would just completely get away from HVAC. Um, where I thought I would go with a history degree, who knows? But, you know, I thought it'd be Indiana Jones, so you never know. Oh, yeah. But <clears throat> I, I learned rather quickly that I was going to need a business degree to be able to do half of anything or at least make sense of it. So that's how I ended up being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurship major at, at Western. And a lot of that was, I didn't want to do straight business management. I really wanted to have that, that other side of it to where I could really see the, how we got to where we needed to be managers. I wanted to see how you built the business and how you change different things. So that was what I really appreciated about an entrepreneurship track as opposed to the straight business management was it really let me see other things that help the business take shape. Yeah, I, I feel like the same way where I went to university and I was thinking I would go to this one called uh, University of West Florida. They have like a great marine archaeology program. Mm -hmm. They have all these shipwrecks out there that you can go and scuba dive for for class credits. And I was like, man, how do I become a treasure hunter? Because that sounds like a great job. And then I was like, okay, it seems like anybody doing this actually needs a bunch of money. And I was like, okay, how do I do that? And it's like, it led me to this, the, my degree is also business management, but we have like an entrepreneurship department and they have like a bunch of classes geared towards that. So like the last semester of my, of my degree was um, just creating businesses and then working with local business owners to try and, you know, do something for them, whether it was, uh, you know, extend their marketing outreach or find me a new sales funnel. Like the guy that I worked with, he was like, how do I, locate people whose houses have just burned down that want to sell them and he's like i can rebuild them for a hundred dollars a square foot and i was like all right and so i found him a way to do that and so he got this app on his phone that we had and every time there was a, a house fire it would alert him and then he can go like look up the gis and see who owns it and go and contact them which i don't know if that's a great thing but you know a lot of those people don't want to deal with the hassle of rebuilding the house and and it was it was really awesome to be able to get into a business like that or or like the ones that we've started and and really there's just such a very problem set you know and it's like really interesting in my opinion to try and solve this problem set and i don't know it's like something new every day comes up and you're like okay why do we do this um how do we solve it and what are the best methods to do so and it's just been really fun honestly well in this this industry you definitely get to do the same thing because every day there's a different kind of problem you get to figure out and i think one of one of the best things you did wyatt was 
before you guys started the business, you still actually went and worked in the field. And that's where that's where there's also one of the biggest disconnects is there's a lot of people that end up managing heating in their businesses or even being in sales that have never done any of it. They've never been in a crawl space, never been in an attic. So they don't they don't always know what their technicians and what their salespeople are going through when they go out to try to serve a customer. That used yeah. to be our sales pitch. <laughs> yeah. It was like I would go out on an estimate with him. And I was like, you'll be seeing us if you go with us. I was like, it'll be a start to finish thing. I'm not sending out a, a couple of people who've never been here before. I was like, you'll, yep. you'll see us again soon. Yeah. And I think it's, it's honestly something that we've debated with one another, or at least discussed where it's like, how do we hire a salesperson or, um, really we, we want to be able to promote from within. So like finding guys that we have right now that are motivated enough to take on that sales responsibility and, and maybe even go like full commission because we really want them to be able to know what it's like to install or to service equipment. And then honestly, I think nothing builds a better customer relationship when you show up to a house and they're like, oh, I need a new unit. And it turns out like actually the thermostat is just bad or actually, you know, you, you do the fix for them while you're there and that's gonna be a customer for life. No, and that's the truth. Yeah, not, not every, sales um opportunity needs to be a new system it's like sometimes people just need their system fixed and the person that went out there before didn't know what they were doing and it's like yeah i think it's so essential like me me and uh, crawford we went out on plenty of jobs uh at this other company where we would show up and it's like all right send it <laughs> you know it's like go figure it out um you know it doesn't really fit in there so just you know make it work and it's like uh, that's not really supporting your guys and we want to have an environment where we like support each other we give each other the good jobs um you know what i mean like i just feel like that would actually build camaraderie within a team and an organization uh, does that make sense no it makes perfect sense and you know it's also you know it's kind of the same thing to where you guys a, a lot of times family businesses the butt heads all the time um, and you guys have really found a way to have, you know, kind of a good dynamic between each other by trusting each other's individual strengths to kind of complement one another. How do you balance the family and business side of it and kind of keep that healthy working relationship to where you're not just absolutely driving each other nuts? Because you see each other at work, then you're seeing each other later. Sometimes it just can get, start rubbing each other the wrong way, whether you want to or not. So how do you keep that balance? Trade crew contractors, I'd like for you to meet the Bosch Climate 5000 Generation 3 range of ductless inverter mini splits. The mini split systems that are engineered for excellence and designed with you in mind. Equipped with advanced inverter technology, these systems adjust to the needs of the space, providing consistent comfort and top tier energy efficiency. Your clients get the comfort they demand, and you get the peace of mind knowing it's a Bosch. And did I mention it's extremely easy to install and service, whisper quiet, and built to last? Your clients will barely know it's there until they see those low energy bills. Plus, with a varied selection of indoor unit options including wall mounts, cassettes, ducted air handlers, and optional controls upgrades, you can offer solutions that fit any space, from residential to light commercial. The Bosch Climate 5000 Generation 3 of Inverter Ducted Mini Splits is the professional's choice for a job well done. Install with confidence and keep your clients cool, calm, and comfortable year-round. Reach out to Insight Partners in the Carolinas and Georgia, or make sure to check out the Bosch link in the HVACRD.com vendor hub for more information about their products and to find a distributor partner near you. And now, back to the show. Well, I remember one thing we did early on when we start, when we finally brought on our first tech was we started doing like we started actually trying to really divide up the workload and I, it was like, all right, every Thursday and Friday, Wyatt is doing office work because we have such a backlog. And it was like, I think a good thing is, uh, you know, when, when you can make sure that we're not working all day, every day, like when we started, it was pretty much a every single day kind of a job. So all weekend, I mean, I'd be working at night making estimates like, that, that amount of workload will stress you out. And then sometimes Wyatt has a rule, like if we uh, do something, like we had like some family up a few weeks ago and it was like, hey, can you just not talk about work for four hours, please? 
And I was like, all yep. right, I got a lot to talk about with you, but fine. And uh, stuff like that kind of helps because yeah, like uh, we used to like go like fishing and stuff. And I mean, we still do that, but it's like, you, you still gotta be friends. And then I think the most stressful part about business with families is like, you know, a small business where it basically, you know, we started, I guess in 2020, cause we could do service calls, but 2021 to now, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's still a pretty young business and we're, we're in like the high failure rate zone still. So that, that could be something that that's a little bit scary for people. So I'd say you need to have a lot of trust that the other person's going to get after it. And, you know, if things don't work out, it's like, we could just, we just keep trying. Yeah. I think something that's helped us is that we've, I don't know, we've had a, a, different family dynamic than most people where me and Bubba really looked out for each other growing up and I don't know that that level of trust was always there um and just always being yeah always being there for each other always doing fun things together um always having the idea that we would be in business together even growing up like we wanted to be on the same uh major league baseball team growing up we wanted to like <laughs> then own a marina together you know be on the same er everything and then we finally actually got the opportunity to have this business together. And I think um, something that does help is that we are competent in our areas of expertise. And so, you know, I think that we do make a good team, but honestly it has been hard to balance that dynamic of like, how do we still remain brothers and have fun while also being business partners and, you know, running a good business because it, it very easily can be us talking about our business all the time and things mm -hmm. to do because the problem like there's going to be infinite problems that, that arise and infinite scenarios that we can talk about and so it's like having the self-awareness to be like okay let's let's maybe just cut it out for a bit and let's talk about the fun things you know let's talk about the things that we are working for you know we want to go on cool fishing trips you know for instance it's like where do you want to go next or or you're starting um, families yeah or we're starting yep. families or we want to talk about whatever it is man and it's like you got to be like on on top of it to not always talk about business and honestly when we first started we lived together for the first year and a half of our business so it was like we would go to work we'd come back and then it'd be like, okay, I'm trying to relax, but we're actually next to each other. It's really easy to just keep talking about the jobs or whatever it is. And so we learned over time to just kind of like, you know, put a lid on it until tomorrow. So it's really hard. That was where at times my dad and I would struggle was we just, we just took it home. Uh, yeah. We would take it home and you'd, we try so hard. And then, you know, before you know it, it's midnight you know 1 a.m and we're talking around the island in the kitchen about work still we've got to get up at 6 30 to go back and do yes, it again it's really like amazing. we got to stop this um so i love that you guys are so cognizant of the you know look at it from the ten thousand you know foot view because i think that's where you know knowing that you're in that position to where you're still you know in a very prime to, to fail spot in the first five years and understanding the different things that you guys are still running into a lot of younger companies don't Unfortunately, they don't have the the thought process to really do that. So listening to you guys already have that kind of in place that, that feels like you guys are really setting yourselves up more for success in the first place. Um, but what were, aside from the fact that you started a business in a pandemic, what were some of kind of your biggest first challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? I'd say biggest first challenge was um, easily, uh, going to be client acquisition. And, um, I think, uh, we, we had to make some sacrifice. So, so like Wyatt was willing to go, I guess you'd say jobless. I mean, he was the co-CEO of our company, but yep. you know, jobs are income. So he would sit there every day on his computer and develop our website. And he would learn like, what is, what is SEO? I mean, that's a crazy word that a lot of people talk about, but you know, and then we were networking in our free time with like real estate agents from Wyatt's wife was, uh, in, in that network, like people that we know would call us if they saw us enough and we were at the forefront of their mind. So that initial sacrifice to 
jump that hurdle of being completely unknown in a place where everybody's kind of related and knows each other. Yep. That I think that was the biggest thing. Cause I think the skills were definitely there early on. And then I think that, uh, just being able to put those skills in front of a client was the most difficult thing. What do you think? Yeah, I think that the client acquisition was probably the hardest part. I had a, my, my last teacher at FAU, she was like, without sales, you don't have a business. <laughs> and I was like, okay. No, so sales, sales cures all. She's like, the only thing you need to know for accounting is revenue minus expenses. I was like, okay, so we got to get it started. And like, uh, our first change out, my wife was at a job interview for a real estate office up here. And while she's sitting in the interview with this guy, he takes a phone call and she's like, okay. And uh, this guy is taking a phone call from an HVAC company. He's like, I'm sorry, but they haven't called me back in weeks and I really need a change out right now. He's like, my heat pump doesn't work and blah, blah, blah. And he gets on the phone with the guy and the guy's giving him a run around of like, why didn't call back or anything? He's mm -hmm. like, oh, I got to come back out to give you another quote. The guy's like, he hangs up and he's frustrated. My wife is like, sounds like you need an HVAC contractor. He's like, yeah. And she's like, well, my husband has a company. <laughs> and that was literally our first change out, man. I went over there. The guy was so impressed and he turned out to be like a really good client. He would always talk about us. And I think something for like new and up and coming um, companies that really helped us was getting into like our local realtor association. So mm -hmm. the one up here is called like High Car, High Country Association of Realtors. And like, just like um, being there and we participated in some events and we were like part of some, I don't know, scholarship council or whatever they did. It was like, um, just by being there and networking with these people, these people are always selling houses. They're in front of so many different clients. They're talking to people that are literally moving from out of state. So they don't know anybody. And so we got onto a lot of the local real estate company preferred contractor lists. And, um, that really helped. It's, it's sometimes difficult, uh, working with real estate agents cause they usually want, you know, quotes immediately. They want you out there like today. Mm -hmm. like later tonight so it was a little challenging but for up-and-coming companies that are that are hungry like um that are willing to work it's like the the work is there i would just honestly i would go to a bunch of real estate offices because they're always looking for new contractors that are reliable and that answer their phone because because that's what they worry about so um yeah definitely client acquisition was like our toughest first thing i remember our first month in business we made twelve hundred dollars and I was like, we're freaking rich, man. Um, <laughs> once I saw that, I was like, we can do this. And uh, <laughs> those people ended up buying like a whole mini split home system from us for like so much money. And it was awesome. And um, I don't know, a lot of those first clients I still remember, you know, like I still remember their names. I know what their houses look like. I know what their crawl spaces look like too, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed about about my dad growing up was that, you know, most of the time he didn't just have customers. He made friends. Like, you know, I remember we would go and we'd go on a service call and we'd fix this, this family's equipment. And then like three weeks later, you know, the husband and wife are over, you know, for a barbecue on the weekend at, at our house. Like it never failed. Like we always had customers always became friends. And I don't know if that's just, the way my dad was wired, which I think it is, he's just always had a gift of gab. Um, but he just, you know, he, he just, in a lot of cases, it's almost like he's never met a stranger wow. and he just, he just found ways to, to connect with people. And I think that's why he's always had so much fun, you know, doing the business or, or running this business is because he just enjoys the people. And I think you have to enjoy people to, to a point to be in a service business. Um, so, and you know, you talking about really remembering your first customers, what were some of those first milestones aside from you know, your first job, first change out, what were some of those milestones of business that you guys really were looking forward to? And as you hit them, you kind of knew you had to celebrate because it was going to work. I think, um, first big one, we, we, um, <clears throat> we got a client that uh, it was like a classic DIY mini split guy needing somebody to pull a vacuum. And of course 
he called every company and eventually found me and I was definitely going to say yes. And his neighbor called us and we ended up putting in a five zone branch port box mini split. And when we finished that, I was like, I don't even think other companies up here would try to do this. It, it was, you know, it's not like it's like the craziest job ever, but I was like, this, we're the smallest company and there's probably one of these in our whole area and it's ours. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, we bragged about that a lot. I still brag about it. And that kind of set a stage for a lot of people kind of getting like, like we were suddenly on their radar. And I think within that job firing up, it was maybe six weeks. And I still worked for another company too uh, during this time. They were very nice to not like fire me for doing side jobs. That's just kind of how people up here are. They're like, oh, we'd love to see you succeed. I was like, oh, thank you. And uh, they, uh, I, I ended up quitting my job because we got enough buzz around us that I, I got a really big client. And that, that was like the first like real milestone was, was confidently not quitting, but confidently putting in my two weeks notice and saying like, I'm like starting, I, I'm going to jump into this too. Like, I think we can support ourselves. Yeah. I, I remember, um, so we started our business, like really got going in August of 2021 and by december it was like december 22nd or something and it was bubba's last day at work because we we got this new construction client or it wasn't a new construction he was like renovating his whole house though so he wanted um two uh two gas furnaces and um we did like the whole duct work the gas furnaces and we got paid and i was like no freaking way and then this contractor came by this home builder and he saw the work we were doing and he was having real trouble with his his current uh his people at the time that he was using um stage fact people and the guy it turns out that this guy that we did this gas furnace install for he does the grading for like all of freaking beach mountain so he's like always on new construction sites always working mm -hmm. at houses knows like everybody on the mountain and we just did a good job and uh it's honestly paid off like crazy like that that builder that came over and saw us, he's been our client now this whole time and we've built probably six houses with him. I went on an estimate for a referral from him today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so yeah. it's still producing, <laughs> still getting us uh, more clients, but it's yeah. like those milestones right there, like the first job where Bubba was like, okay, I'm quitting. Um, yeah, I got, first I got so excited. I called my boss and I quit. I was like, I'm not coming in tomorrow. And then I felt really bad like 10 minutes later. And then I was like, let's, <laughs> let's do two weeks. But I, I literally, my last day was December 24th. Yeah. And, but I, I called him up and I was like, Hey, I'm not coming in tomorrow. I'm going to start this. And, and then I, I was like, Oh man, I'm so sorry. I just was excited. I, I won't, I won't leave you like that. Yeah. We saw him the other day too at a restaurant and he was like, Hey, how you guys doing? If you need any help, you know, just, just call us, let us know if you need any parts or anything. It's honestly, it's so hard getting parts up here because everything's like at least a day away. Yeah. You know, cause yeah. he delivers our stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No supply well, and, and, yeah. and I lived that, I lived that same life. You know just in a different part of the mountains you know i remember when we got a supply house in silva like holy crap we you know we're only 25 minutes from <laughs> from getting stuff instead of an hour and 10 to go to Asheville. Oh, you should so, have seen us we would load up my i have a toyota tacoma we would load that thing up with an entire job and we would drive to like morganton when when there was a flex shortage back uh oh god when we were doing some of our stuff we we made fun? a route and we drove to like every supply house in like um eastern tennessee and filled my truck up because they would they would like ration it and then yep. we sent another guy we knew to go do the same thing and then we bought from every supplier we could like we would we didn't have any delivery service or anything we'd go down and pick up our jobs at supply houses off the mountain and then drive it back up and then forget something don't you love it <laughs> That's always the funnest part of, of running this business in the mountains is when you have no service and know you forgot something and have to go back and get it, but you can't find out if they have it until you get 30 minutes down the road. Yep. Yep. That's, I mean, that's a fun challenge, but I wouldn't call that as much of a hurdle as client acquisition. That's just like a frustrating. No, yeah. That's just, that's just a logistical, that's a logistical anomaly that we can figure out at a later date. You know, talking about one of the first things that, that you said, really felt like set you guys apart was the fact that you did a multi-head mini split job the high country itself and you know the mountain regions of north carolina kind of have their own sets of challenges in the first place 
you know, aside from unique climate, environmental influence, you know, there's also a lot of older homes that, you know, people still live in that's retrofitting, but they've never had any kind of central cooling. They might have had central heat, but it may have only been, you know, a fireplace, potentially a small furnace. But a lot of times there's no crawl space, there's no attic. So there's there's a lot of mini split applications too. So, you know, what are the some some of the very unique challenges that you guys have been able to kind of set yourself apart with by having solutions for that other people weren't doing? Uh, I think one thing, um, I mean, I, we, we love safety and stuff, but I'm willing to do a lot of things that I think people think are really dangerous. <laughs> so that, that, I'm serious. Like, you know, you ever see like some of our mountainsides up here, like you could have oh, like yeah. a 60 foot tall gable on your house when you, when you get all the way past the crawl space and everything. And uh, oh, yeah. I'd say like, that comes from like past jobs, like oil, oil rigging. Like, I'm just like, oh man, we can do this. I'm always saying we can do this, even if it's like crazy. And then, uh, the, um, I'd say the, the logistics of like getting everything to somebody's house is, is a big challenge that some people will turn a job down because the driveway is too crazy or something like that. And, um, and then there's, there's a lot of houses, like you said, that are just loaded with baseboards and maybe like a, a wall mount mini split won't work because they don't have the right exterior walls in this room. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, well, they got ceiling mounted mini splits. Like we put in a floor mounted mini split once for somebody and uh one of our workers uh our installer he showed his brother who also does hvac and he was like i have no idea what that is <laughs> so so i think it's like doing like simple things that are available is actually like a, a solution that some people just get really stuck in their ways they just like put in the same three systems every day and i'm like there's entire product catalogs out here and I bet if I call up one of my distributors, they'll have something that'll work if I just send them some pictures. So we, we do that a lot up here and I think it pays off. So dangerous things and thinking outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, and I agree. I definitely agree with the thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Thing. I'm you a, I'm a walking a OSHA violation, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll hack that part out of the show. We'll beat that. Nah, nah, no way I'll know. No way I'll know. Just kidding. Um, so, you know, obviously solving different problems is, is a major advantage for you guys because you're willing to look at, you know, alternative solutions that a lot of people may not look at in the past. You know, and some of that plays into, you know, how quick our industry is evolving. So what are some things that you guys do to really kind of stay ahead of the trends in the market? And what are you doing to kind of ensure that your transition through crazy refrigerants and everything else we've got going on will help you guys remain competitive and, and moving forward? I think a lot of just, just research, like, I mean, you know, that RTFM, good old read, read the manual. Um, we do just, just that probably sets you apart head and shoulders on, on the latest trends because a new piece of equipment will tell you everything you need. But I do, I mean, I call you a lot just to like talk to you and I'm like, who's going to know more about what products are coming up than the guy that sells me the product. And then pretty much any time one of our distributors or manufacturer offers us any kind of, I mean, I love going on the the free trips and stuff, but if they offer us pretty much anything like, Oh, we've got a contractor day. We have a, we got a trip to a factory. We have a, come meet me for lunch. I'll usually just say yes. And then figure it out how to get there because those are always places where they're going to give you a class or there's going to be somebody there. That's going to tell you something very important. That's about to come up or something you've never heard of before. And so I'm usually just willing to jump at those little opportunities that seem to get presented a lot. I think a lot of people are just like, oh, no, it's summer. I'm too busy. I'm like, no way, man. The next summer, this I might have a conversation with somebody that they're, they're going to tell me about something that, that I've never heard of before that's going to affect me like years down the line. Yeah, something that I'd like to do is just talk to your distributor, like the, the desk clerks, people that you're ordering from they have so much contact with all the contractors around them and they know what they're selling out of their branch. And so, you know, if, if the industry, which as of late has been trending a lot towards more service work and repair work rather Mm -hmm. than new installations, um, it's something for us to take into account. It's like, okay, what do we need to do for that? 
for our for our new social media posts, let's do something like a ten dollar discount on all service work, or like <laughs> you know ten percent off maintenance agreements because people are going to want to maintenance their equipment before it breaks, or you know have someone out there checking on it, and I, I think that really helps. And then honestly, like when we went on we went on a trip recently for a distributor, and while we were there, um, we were talking to this uh, this sales rep. And he's like, these trips are so that you can contact or you you have contact with other contractors. That's the Mm -hmm. greatest benefit is talking to these other contractors, seeing what they're doing. How are they adjusting to trends? What have they seen in their market? And what are some things that they're doing right? Because, you know, there's always something that can be improved. There's always something that you can you can learn from these people who are out here doing this. Like like one guy we talked to, man, he had like 30 trucks on the road, no warehouse. He had no physical space. I was like, how do you do that? He's like, physical space is a waste of money. He's like, I just tell them to go to the distributors to go pick up their parts in the morning. And I'm like, you know, for, for our area, that, that's not necessarily going to work. Our it's not, it's not always going to work everywhere you are. It depends on, exactly. so it depends on the sure distributor he, network of where you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah he, he was just a Amazon distributor, man. It was, it was crazy. Like he was able to go to all these different warehouses in this area. And, and literally you have 30 service techs out there and all in different trucks, just wheeling and dealing. It was, it was really cool to hear though, like these different avenues that people can take. So I think that like talking to the distributor, talking to you, um, seeing what the market's doing as a whole, and then talking to other contractors in your area and like in the surrounding area, seeing what people are doing, you know, the the internet, the news, there's literally like the next like 10 years of litigation the next 10 years of new laws that are coming into place. Yeah, it's it's all being talked of, about right now. If you just yeah. look at the back pages of, of the ACHR yeah. news and everything. Yeah. Else. Like, like a lot of these phase outs and laws have been on the books for, for a while. Like, like the, the A2L is not like just, they didn't just like pull it out of their ass. Like yesterday, this has been a thing. It's kind of like when, when they did a hard stop on all that equipment um, mm-hmm. to up, update C ratings is like, yeah, they didn't just like decide to do that in November. Like it was, it was in the books and, and people, I, I think they freak out about things that are kind of just, it's like saying like you, you didn't know that summer was about to happen or something. Well, and, and people will freak out about it sometimes because they just didn't attempt to get educated on it or they just didn't listen when someone tried to educate them on it. The amount of times that, you know, I would have conversations with people about SEER 2 change or you know, FER, which was the one before, you know, furnace fit efficiency ratings of motors changed, all these different things. The amount of times I would tell people about it, and then a month later, the same person would ask me a question about it, and they would say, well, I didn't know that was happening. I'm like, no, you did. You just, you're not listening. Um, it happens, and, and sometimes it happens just because you get so busy that it just, it flies right by and you don't even think about it. Um, but then, you know, I think one of those things you were also talking about with sales and service is as you see kind of that ebb and flow, you know, service and sales are both, they're so closely linked and they're so totally different at the same time. Um, and sometimes when you get in these these service kind of related circles where that's the way the market's going a lot of times, when you try to convert it from a service call to a sale because you have to, it almost feels pushy to the customer sometimes whether you want it to or not. So how do you balance that being persuasive, you know, by also being, you know, genuine and customer first, you know, customer, I guess say customer first forward in a situation where most of the time it was service, but ma'am, now's the time we got to do it. You don't really have a choice. I think, um, I got pretty lucky, um, with the companies that I worked with initially because I, I never really uh, was in one of those pushy sales environments. Like even the corporate company, just they had a really good, um, I think, uh, like business base. You know, they had a lot of returned customers and stuff. So they weren't out there like leading by example by just like forcing sales down people's throats or, or being dishonest. You know, and then the, the family-based business, you know, just super honest people. So. Um, I almost get the feeling sometimes like, I'm like, you know, March comes around, it gets a little slow. I'm like, I gotta like, what do I gotta do? And it's, uh, it's almost like sometimes, uh, 
when we have conversations, why and I usually do like business health checkups with each other, like every week he's like, all right, this is how much money we made. This is how much money like is going out the door. This is what like we can support if we stay like this for X amount of time and getting really wrapped up in the, the sales pitch and the numbers is, is more of like an anxiety thing. I think, uh, mm-hmm. trusting our process and the fact that I am, we, we did hire recently a new service tech, so it's working out pretty good, but I did a lot of the service and the sales. So they were like seeing kind of the same guy out there, um, fixing their system and maybe like taking away the, the pressure from the situation to make the sale. And then, you know, hopefully it turns into a long-term thing where sometimes there's catastrophic things I can't do anything about, but that doesn't have to be today. And nobody has to actually pull the trigger on anything. And it come, the, those laws and stuff we were talking about too, like, like we don't, you know, I, I don't like when I get the feeling that maybe somebody was pressured a little bit in, in an interaction they had to kind of like jump on something before everything changed. Like, yeah, you don't really have to do that. I mean, prices are always fluctuating, going up a little bit and trending, but like, don't just buy equipment now because the future is is around the corner. That's that's kind of, we we try to to depressurize the situation as much as possible. Yeah, it it, it seems like, you know, there, there have been multiple people that we've talked to that have been in those high pressure sales scenarios. And they're like, well, so-and-so said that you know, because it's R22, like I have to change the system because it's illegal. And I'm like, that that's crazy. You know, like, I don't want to be dishonest. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, I just that. like, you, you know, and it's like, okay, well, how do we maintain integrity with our business, maintain honesty and also drive sales? And I think that the lifetime value of any customer is greater than what you can achieve by being pushy for a sale one day. And so like that one customer, you're going to service their, their equipment. They're going to get a maintenance agreement. You might change a few capacitors that might, the system might die. And then they're like, you know what? I want to repair it. I just want to change it out. And it's like, when, when it's time to change out, it will change out. And you know, sometimes it does get slow here and I don't think that it's, that it's like necessarily on us to, to start, you know, pressuring customers or persuading them one way or not. It's on us to actually work on our systems. You know, what sort of processes have we set up to acquire new clients? How are we looking, you know, what, what, what's our footprint out there on social media, on the internet, um, in, in reality to like, where are our signs up? You know, what are things that we can be focusing on that actually drive sales rather than looking at the numbers and fretting about them if they are going down. And so it's something that we've learned too, is to like sit back and kind of trust the process, you know, trust ourselves enough to be like, okay, we're making the right decisions. Our, our, our views are increasing. We just keep punching out these things and we keep being who we are. Like we don't sacrifice who we are uh, for sale. And, you know, I've had those jobs where, you know, I've been a car salesman, I've sold flooring and it's like, Sometimes in those roles, people pressure you to make a sale on every single customer and they want you to sell the most expensive thing. And then if you can't sell that, tell them you'll take $10 off. And it's like, it's icky, you know, (laughs) like, does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Like, you, I don't know. No, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So it's like, um, I don't know. That's kind of how I feel about it. It's like, I, I, I would just rather be honest and, you know, tell them what they need. Tell them that, you know, we can upgrade it and you probably won't have to deal with you know, these things going bad over time or, or within the next year or so. And it's like, or we can keep it living along as long as possible. What do you want to do? We also offer financing. <laughs> well, and it's <clears throat> the important thing is if you can give customers truly all their options, then you're in, you know, you're in a better position. And that kind of leads me into talking a little bit about more. I'll, we'll talk some about Bosch just because one, their show sponsor too. You guys are Bosch guys. I'm a Bosch guy. You guys know that as a Home Comfort Pro dealer, one of the things that is most important for you guys is customer education. And that's already something you guys have have talked about, maybe not called it customer education, but you've you've called kind of that, you know, taking care of the homeowner approach from the beginning with everything you guys have talked about how you do stuff. So let's say you're you're in a position, you're looking at a change out. Um, How do you educate customers on advantages of something like a Bosch product versus traditional unitary stuff 
especially in your market. What's up, trade crew? Are you tired of playing microfarad hide-and-seek with your service truck inventory? I think it's time that you tested out the Turbo 200 family from AMRAD Manufacturing and Global to Source, where efficiency meets durability and finding the right capacitor is never a game of chance. With the Turbo family of universal capacitors, you're not just getting any regular capacitor. No, no, no. You're getting the HVAC Industries version of a superhero cape. Reliable, efficient, ready to save the day, these ruggedly tested made-in-the-USA capacitors are prepared for whatever you run into during your service calls. These truly unique and industry-changing universal capacitors allow you to replace over 200 individual sizes with just their four models, the Turbo 200, Turbo 200X, Turbo Mini, and Turbo Mini Oval. And did I mention they have a five-year warranty? Seriously, what are you waiting for? Do the math and upgrade your truck stock setup today because the Turbo family has got you covered. Visit the HVAC R&D Vendor Hub and click on the Global Source link to request training from a local account executive in your market. Easy peasy. AMRAD Manufacturing, where performance meets perfection. Because in the world of HVAC, good enough isn't in our vocabulary. It's turbo or nothing. And now, back to the show. I think, uh, you know, the biggest thing up here is... The, the thing that makes people most uncomfortable here is definitely going to be cold. You know, yep. it, it gets it gets much colder here than you know. You could go 20 minutes down the mountain a bit, and it's a whole different season. So, uh, the fact that they deliver so much heat so consistently at such a range of temperatures, and the, the matchups that you can do with it, like Bosch has matchups on like a five on a three, you know, five ton outdoor on like a three ton. You, you can maintain a lot of heat output with a rated system, not, you know, and then they match up to um, a lot of different air handlers and, you know, situations where you need to get smaller. But the, the things that homeowners really, really harp on up here is, you know, I've, my heat pump, it costs a lot of money because uh, it's like 38 or 32 degrees out and it's already like, really drawing on my heat strips yep and you know these these uh older systems or the base model systems that a lot of brands put out they don't function very good up here when it starts getting cold and these these things keep working and i can tell them that and then while it's being installed you know i kind of like to reinforce that and then once their electric bills start coming that's when we start getting compliments and uh you know, like we work for uh, TVA, um, Mountain Electric Cooperative, mm -hmm. and they even offer rebates for, you know, just about every Bosch matchup has a rebate available through our local electric co-op. And that's, that's something that you, you can educate a, a potential client on, you know, the benefits that they're going to get, the benefit the electrical get, grid gets from selecting this. And then, you know, you got your noise on a, a Bosch startup, you take something outside that that's that's like a wow moment. That's like a sales pitch to their friends because they're going to hear it start up. And if they've never had an inverter style system before and this thing comes on or the hot start, you know, just go stand mm -hmm. for that because they complain that the heat pump feels cold. And once it finally starts blowing, they're like, oh my goodness, you, you know, you, this is what you said it would do. So, and I mean, there's so many more things, but those are, I'd, I'd say noise, heat and energy bills are all like the biggest sellers of, of what Bosch brings to the table. Well, and you know, the heat pump market has continued to push itself into the mountain regions just because so many people are on LP gas, which it was always, you know, the issue is being very expensive, you know, where I was in the mountains. A lot of the times I would say 95% of the systems that we put in were, were dual fuel almost regardless. It was either heat pump or dual fuel very very rare were we doing straight air conditioning um up in the mountains because you were trying to keep it off of lp as long as possible in a lot of situations and you know now that you have different energy co-ops are also pitching in <clears throat> as people start to you know move to more energy efficient solutions what kind of what process do you kind of work with 
with your homeowners for deciding which potential Bosch products will be recommended for their for their home? Do you kind of have a most likely uh, and, this one's going to be a furnace and dual fuel system, or more likely this is going to be a heat pump? You know, how do you go to market with a homeowner? You know, is it all based on initially what they want, or do you kind of lead them as what you truly feel is the best solution for the house? Well, I mean, in in all the a lot of change outs, I, I usually won't try to like get somebody completely off gas. Um, if if you know, say we have a gas with AC at a house, yep. Uh, I won't I won't try to like completely get them off because you know maybe they use like already all these gas appliances or mm-hmm. they really trust that heat. But I a good thing, Bosch. You know they have their furnaces too, so I'll just be like, well have we considered a dual fuel option where maybe we don't, we still have your gas because you love it and you trust it, but you try this heat pump and you know, you can, depending on what the balance point comes out to, you might have something that's running into the teens still as a, as a heat pump before it has to kick over. And correct. You know, to, to have somebody actually experience that and see it, you know, with their own eyes, that that becomes a big selling point to other customers. They're like, yeah, this thing actually works. Like most people, I think, up here, the generic setback, they just go with 40 degrees. And yep. you know, if you're if you're trying to get electrical co-op um, <clears throat> rebates for people, I mean, you have to go through and do a real load calculation. And a real load calculation will match to all these Bosch products. You know, you, you select the equipment to that. And when somebody sees you go through that process in front of them, where you're measuring their house, or you're, you're actually like taking into account everything that they have, and then you're matching a product to that, that I think that's where that trust is gained. And, and Bosch has so many products that will get them so many benefits that like, it's like I don't even have like I don't I don't have like a favorite one or one that I choose all the time. It's just like the one that matches. I can I can good better best them with three things that are better than a baseline from somewhere else. Yeah, and it seems like when people have us in their house, a main concern for them with contractors of all kinds is they want the job done right. They want yep. to have someone out there seven times to go fix problems. And something that we do like about the box is that. Uh, more often times than not, if it's not installer error, it's going to work correctly, you know, and it's like, it's going to, like you said, it's going to produce that heat. And what we really like is the efficiency, the quiet, um, matching people up with a system that is going to perform a lot better than their old system. And I don't know, I, I think that as we, as a society move towards more efficient appliances of all kinds, it's like... The Bo- if, if Bosch keeps producing at the quality they are and keeps innovating in the way that they are, they're going to be a really big competitor in the HVAC market. Well, I was going to say, speaking of future inventions um, from Bosch that you guys are potentially most excited about, I already know that the answer to this question, but so what's the next thing that Bosch is bringing out that you are the most excited for and how do you see it impacting your business? Oh yeah, man. Uh, I think uh, that's going to be a real game changer. I mean, the, the preliminary specs and stuff and how they kind of unveiled it. Yep. So he's talking about IDS Ultra is what he's talking about, which is the ultra low climate um, Bosch heat pump that will come out for R454B um, as an A2O refrigerant model. It's the first one they announced. It was, I actually got to see, you know, the, the mock-up of it and kind of some of the first, I guess, what's the right word? can't think of the right word it's not the mock-up but it's the the initial engineered model was at um ahr back in the spring or not spring but winter in chicago yeah that uh we're definitely i mean i'm pretty sure uh i had sent you like a news story i heard about it and then you sent me a picture of the one in front of you yep at the thing and you're like oh yeah i I know all about this and i was like yeah i'm very interested in this so i've definitely I think that something like that would definitely fit in well. I mean, a lot of the um, the different models of mini splits have, have very low rated capacities and uh, that's a big seller up here. And I think, uh, I haven't seen the AHRI stuff on it. I don't know if that's out yet, but. I don't know if it is. I think all I've seen is the, the official first white paper on it, on it came out last Thursday. So I'm pretty optimistic that the uh, the balance points and stuff, um, some of these inverter products have a big like 
you know, at 17 degrees, you know, it's, it, it has a dip and then at five degrees, it suddenly actually goes back up again. And I'm hoping that this one's a little more linear on, uh, on how it's uh, rated. And that way it'll, it'll, it'll just help qualify people for, for better rebates. And then it'll also be something that, you know, without using electricity as your or electric strips, uh, it's, it's going to save a ton of money. Yeah, when we were we were staying at Bubba's house for our first winter up here, and he has two like old carriers, uh, heat pumps, one on each level. Um, we were running heat strips probably from October to March, and so it was oh, like geez. the Alconia, It was like every month was like three fifty plus in in electric bill. Yeah, I got up to four fifty. Yeah, and we were like, oh my gosh, and we're keeping it. 67 66 at night it's like not very hot in there you know not even like i'm kind of walking around with sweatshirts and stuff and i'm like man these heat pumps are struggling so it's going to be such i i hope that if it works well it's going to be like something that we're going to try and sell on like every every sales pitch because it's like that's what our market needs up here is those low ambient heat pumps that can produce at five degrees because you know, our coldest days are probably like zero degrees every now and then. So it's like not very far off. So you'll probably run your heat strips every now and then. But it's like, man, I just think there's such a big market that they can tap into, especially like across North America. You know, everywhere north of Virginia is probably getting pretty cold. So yeah, and then and then that, you know, that good old fashioned, that good, better, best, you know, sales pitch. Um, it's cool. I, I currently like a lot of stuff I'll, I'll have all Bosch if if I know the client is listening or some, maybe sometimes they do their research. So to have like a good, better, best and, and the best is really the best, that's going to be cool. No, I agree with that. Um, and there's a lot of people that good, better, best isn't really always truly a good, better, best. I think that's one of the interesting things that you can do with, with Bosch, even though we have, we have significantly less skews than almost every other manufacturer but we have so many different ways we can match stuff up to make a solution it's it's interesting yeah i put that i put that 15s here on a on a the two-stage air handler the other day i think that bumped it up to 16 i mean it's just a, it's a quiet system that's that's a huge thing that quiet startup you know the the fans barely running most of the time of the day that people don't even know that system's on sometimes their house is comfortable so I like, when I can deliver that, I like to brag about that a lot. I, I won't shut up about it. So what advice would you give another HVAC company that's considering using a Bosch product? I'd say like in our little 50 mile bubble, probably don't use it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, um, you know, it's, it's a good way to like break into selling high efficiency equipment with uh, it's not like it's like dumbed down too much or anything, but like the like you were saying earlier, you don't have a lot of SKUs, so you know you've got you've got a couple of outdoor units, a couple of air handlers, and then maybe a couple of like you know side products you could use in case that have real matchups. But you you can put in a twenty seer system without having to send all your techs to like a two day course on how to run thermostat wires in a way that won't cause your yep. communicating system to bleed voltage and then tell it to do something crazy all the time. So like, it's not a very frustrating process to run a 24 volt thermostat to a system that kind of communicates through a refrigerant with itself. It's a, uh, it's a lot easier. And then as a salesperson, you don't have to train yourself on 50 products and constantly changing products. Like I've, I've sold the same kind of Bosch products for like the whole time we've been in business. And I haven't had to relearn a whole product line every time that the laws slightly change. It's it's pretty cool to not have to constantly be on some relearning mission. Well, and I think one of the nice things about it, and you said it, it's not it's not dumbed down. It's just not overcomplicated. I think that's the best way to put it, because you can run their most high efficient system with a basic thermostat because. It's not all about the algorithms that you've built into this $500, you know, mini computer you got to put on the wall. Um, it's done with with the principles of refrigeration. What a novel concept. And, and I think this is something else, you know, as we've talked about it through the show, especially where you've 
you've been lucky that you've worked with people that, you know, were supportive of you going into the industry and, and making your own way. So, you know, in a competitive industry like HVAC, how do you build strong relationships with your other contractors, which where we talked about it, collaboration is extremely crucial in what we do, but how do you avoid letting competition affect those connections with your fellow contractors in the same market? Man, like I said the other day, uh, on Tuesday, we went out to eat lunch and we literally saw the other contractor there and he was just there with his family. And they, were, uh, they were so nice. We told him like that day we had to run down the supply house in, in Morganton, so about an hour from us. And they were like, man, if you need anything, you know, you just call us up. If you're ever missing something on a job, they're like, we got you. And honestly, when we first started out, there were so many calls that they didn't want to take and that the other company that we worked for didn't want to take. And all those dispatchers sent them our way. So Ooh, it was I'll make sure to blurt that out. Right. But man, Ooh, totally yeah, I, I'd say like, honestly, <laughs> for the most part contractors are going to be a great resource for you like if if they are doing something like really secretive and they don't want to say it and they don't want to talk to you like that's one thing it's okay just call up the next one like most people want to talk about what they do for a living and most contractors don't have many other contractors at their company to talk about uh, things with so it's like such a resource for us honestly every time we go to one of those dealer shows at gem air or at the other distributors like Ferguson or Insight, it's like, I don't know, it's always somewhere, something where like it's such a learning experience, you know? So that's that's what we've experienced. And I don't know, for the most part, we're, we're pretty much willing to talk. And then as people. as outsiders there too, a lot of the, the local contractors are local people. And that area is just, I don't know what it is, but it's full of like really nice people. So they are not like, I don't know, they don't have grudges and stuff or they just are genuinely like they care about you living a good life, it seems. I've, I've got a lot of positive feedback in my journey to business ownership from people who were my bosses. And uh, I don't know if everybody, not everybody's going to get that. Some people will tell their boss, like, I got my contractor license. And the next thing they do is give their boss their keys because they're fired. So yeah. I, I got very lucky that that happened for me. But um, as far as the competition goes too, we're, we're in a lot of different, there's a lot, I almost feel like there's, I, I don't want to like jinx it, but I almost feel like there's too much work from the general like talk around the water cooler with these guys. Like they're, they're turning down jobs because they can't possibly get to it. And they work in different like areas and specialize in different things. Like we don't, we don't make like perfect, like square duct that like follows tiny chases around house like we like to use round pipe that we grab so you know c certain stuff like we don't really fill in yep. for or fit in for and then we we do so many mini splits other guys like still don't maybe they don't trust them as much as us so like a lot of people come to us for mini split stuff and we also service we're not scared really to service any brands so i'll service like weird off-brand mini splits because i know that maybe a uh, they're going to want like a really good one one day and it's fun to learn like weird things. Yeah. Did you, um, when you were working in the HVAC industry, did you ever experience any sort of animosity or anything like that with other contractors or like, did you talk to anyone else about, you know, industry trends, things like that? So we had, you know, we had a group of, of contractors that dad was close with, but then we also had, you know, some that didn't really like a bunch of us very much and some of that was you had one group that were you know all the licensed guys and then you had all the guys that were unlicensed that you kept getting called to go fix their shit installs behind so those guys never liked you um you know we even at one point we had people like calling and threatening you know our family <laughs> This one guy like called and threatened the family like leaving that would never like I death threat like, that would never happen by a yeah, those those fly by night contractor, like big contractors. I mean, yeah. that's they're you know that's their own thing. I, I we almost don't pay them any attention because the the amount of risk you take on it, stuff like that eventually comes back. So, oh you know, yeah, you, you can't you can't do a risky thing a hundred times and not get tagged for something one day. Sometimes a homeowner would be like, "I want it this inspected," and they're like, "Whoa!" You would be surprised <laughs> at the amount of times we saw certain people get just 
get off without really getting in trouble or they just even if they got in trouble they just went back and did it anyway because there just wasn't enough oversight to catch them all the time yeah but you know they're they're not running everything you know oh, it's, no. it's hard to it's hard to leverage like to to really fix something in a, in a bad situation sometimes you have to use a little business leverage and somebody like sneaking parts from the counter at the distributor is probably not gonna be able to pull a whole new unit out of thin no. air but, so, no, so things not. can get, get bad quick with, with that interaction no it can but you know most of the time the majority of our you know correspondence or or everything was was really always positive with with contractors there were there were several that that we worked with on a regular basis that didn't have an h1 license but we did so we did a lot of hydronic um like heated floors for people so like we would do we would go on these huge fontana lake homes that were being built and one contractor would be doing all the unitary work but we'd be the ones that are you know putting the hydronic stuff in the slab so oh, that's cool so we would do different things like that because there weren't a lot of people that could do that or we you know we would work on boilers and different things that were up in highlands and cashers and other places where there wasn't a lot of you know skilled labor to do that sort of thing so so we kind of had a niche in different places with with a skill set that my dad had which which helped us you know be different in the market for a lot of things yeah that that's the the specialization of skills um that's where i think that's where it comes in i mean we don't you don't necessarily have to compete outright with the competition if you're if you're better at one thing than they are they might not even really mess with it unless like they have to and so you just like we've we've got like a guy for everything out there yep well and that's and that's kind of how it comes you know and that's how you also you learn to work you know you learn to work with one another to be able to do those sort of things um, and, you know, sometimes it's frustrating, like, well, I wish we would have gotten everything on the job, but, you know, we need to be grateful for what we did get, you know, and, you know, thanks for these guys for, you know, helping us get in there to do that. So, you know, there's, there's enough work for everybody in this industry. There truly is. And the way everyone from up north and out west keeps moving to the southeast, I think we're in good shape for some time now. <laughs> yeah. Especially up here, being that there are so many houses that don't have AC, they mm -hmm. don't have a court, they just have baseboards, and it's like it's it's only been getting hotter lately. So a lot of these people are just trying to get new duct systems or mini splits, and it's like there's there's new houses going up every day too. So it seems like the supply is is growing. I know we've went through a bunch. It's a Friday night, so I don't want to keep you guys all night long. Um, but you know, looking back. You know things we've talked about, and really over what you guys have experienced building your company. What's what's a key one key takeaway that each of you would like listeners really to remember and kind of add to how they can improve their own business? Turn up the heat in your kitchen tray crew using Cajun Joe's Bayou Spice, the original blend that brings the bold, authentic flavors of the bayou straight to your table. Perfect for grilling, sauteing, low country boiling, or seasoning any dish, Cajun Joe's adds the perfect kick of heat and spice. Whether it's seafood, chicken, gator, beef, pork, veggies, or more, you'll love how this blend transforms your meals. Ready to take your cooking to the next level? Grab your jar today in the HVAC R&D Swag Shop just visit HVACRD.com and spice up your life with Cajun Joe's Bayou Spice. And now, back to the show. I mean, I, I'd say uh, it's a lot of teamwork, uh, a lot of dedication. Um, if you already have an established business, then... I mean, it, you probably do a bunch of stuff way different than how I do it, but uh, there's always like this room for improvement and learning can occur in like the, the weirdest ways. Like I learn a lot from my customers. I learn a lot from talking to other contractors. Um, I learn a lot by delegating tasks. So I will, that, that's like a whole skill set in itself, but you, you it can't is. grow until you learn that delegation process and how to do it. And delegating to people, it's not like uh, telling a machine what to do. So 
you know, machines have like wires and the, the colors match up and like this switch closes and if that switch broken, you swap it out. A person is, is a whole different thing. And so it doesn't always make sense and it's not as intuitive, but I think uh, you should jump on delegating tasks and trusting people and teaching them in a way that you will trust their work as soon as possible. Otherwise, you're going to be working all day, every day, forever. Yeah, like you said, man, it's like you gotta be able to delegate those tasks and you also have to have that trust and it, like what establishes trust, it seems to me like it's being able to effectively train your guys, giving them the tools necessary to complete jobs, listening to what they suggest too, because I think I learn a lot from our installers, you know, I learn a lot from our service people, like what is it like out there, what do you need, what would you prefer to have on a job, and then like being out there and having done it myself it's like i like setting them up to where they don't have to leave the job site again you know i like when you don't have to run to lowe's or the hardware store or you know you need this special tool from the locker it's like not have it all ready to go um i think that something that's really important is learning how to vet employees too learning how to hire the right people um understanding what you're looking for um having a goal of what you want your business to look like and what you, what what do you want to be known for do you want to be the people that just like get every job and just send it or do you want to people be the people that like do it right you know maybe like i don't know i feel like we're a bit smaller but we get those jobs that that we really want to do and 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 have a chance to do something good you know so i just think that learning to vet people learning to build a client base and then listening listening to the customers listening to your employees and, and delegating these are these are really hard skills and i know that's not one thing but honestly, no but it's 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 so kind much. of that whole little it's that whole little package you know um so what advice would you guys give to someone considering a career in the hvac industry especially you know knowing you know what you guys went through as being apprentices and then in sales and then forming your own company i'd say if you're if you're like younger you know, maybe high school or even like middle school level, um, you should really invest your time in like being really sound at like math and science fundamentals. Um, you know, consider, or if you're older and you're trying to get in, like maybe you're in college or, or you have a different job, don't be afraid to like go take a, a college level math class and, and like entry science classes because all the stuff that's going on that you do, you're going to learn a ton in the field on how to install it, but you'll never, or maybe you will, but a lot of people have difficulty grasping concepts when they don't like know the underlying like math and science that, that might be going on behind the scenes. And also if you want to get an HVAC job and you don't necessarily like have an opening or you don't know somebody yet, there's nothing wrong with like becoming a carpenter or um, working for an electrician or a plumber or a roofer, like getting into construction is a big thing as well, because once you do HVAC, you'll see that you're kind of combining a lot of trades into one and, and versatile employees like that. Like I think me having worked in construction right when I came in, uh, I was doing pretty good because I would go on jobs and I like knew what you could and couldn't cut already. So like, I was, I was like an apprentice, but at the same time, I, I knew, you know, how drains work. I already knew how electricity worked. And then I was also very lucky, like being college educated. Um, I, I understood a little bit about math and science. So like once I started reading like technical manuals and then I purchased, uh, also purchase modern refrigeration and read it and you'll, you'll, you'll be really good at this job, but. It, it came together a lot better with all these like past skills and education. And if you just want to hop in, it, it's going to be difficult. And then the very last thing thrown on and on, uh, <laughs> don't let employers take advantage of you and be willing. Don't just like job hop, but you need to understand business practices and like what people can and can't make you do because like this job is very dangerous. And so your knowledge, is paramount but customer safety and your safety are actually like the most important day-to-day -day things and i see a lot of people getting into really sticky situations because somebody told them and you gotta you gotta know when someone's taking advantage of you or when they're asking you to do something that you shouldn't be doing so 
those are some stellar apprentice things some tips way to yeah. cover yourself mr osha <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean there's there's so many situations where people have told us to do something and we're like actually we're not going to handle that because you know like uh your your whole exhaust vent has been running your your furnace has been running and the exhaust vent is going out into your crawl space and it's it, there's no all the vents are capped because you don't want it to get cold under there and so it's like having the wherewithal to understand what it's safe situations look like mm -hmm. and, and maintaining that safety is honestly we tell all of our guys they're like your first job is to stay safe your second job is to install this and it's like we just try to beat it to their heads to like not mess themselves up because it's really um it's really a dangerous job but in terms of getting into the field man i'd say um if you don't see any job openings call up some places talk to talk to someone in charge and tell them you're like willing and able to work and, and learn and it's like most people want somebody that's willing to call them and keep calling them and that will submit an application a resume it's like just just stay on top of it like places are always hiring and they always want someone who wants to learn it's like the best thing an employer can see and you can also check out our hvac technician tool list on haskellhvac.com and there <laughs> you'll see a bunch of tools that are great for any technician and it's like it's a growing list. It's it's alive, but the, it's not. It's a living document, so we're always adding things. But I think it has a lot of tools that are really essential for installing well. And I think, like you said, read modern refrigeration. And I started before this job. I was in uh, low voltage cabling, so I would do like fiber optic and network services and build out really the infrastructure for uh, network systems and businesses. So that was like a, a construction trade and just learning how to use tools, how to stay safe, how to use ladders. Even I have no idea. Dude, <laughs> no that's, idea how, to, how to use a ladder is a huge one. People really it's don't crazy. understand how unsafe ladders are. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then, and then you start feeling like you're on top of the world. You start getting too high on the ladder and next thing you know, but yeah. So using ladders, like it's, it's a skill to learn. Um, and I'd say just like, you know, freaking take one out of your, your parents' garage if, if you're young or, or go buy one <laughs> and start doing work with your house and like use, learn how to use a hammer. You know, these things that like a lot of people never learn in their life. It's like, uh -huh. start, start trying, um, start reading about the trade. There's plenty of YouTube videos, man, that are actually good. There's plenty that are really bad too, but you know, try <laughs> We, trying to do some critical thinking when they're doing stuff and then, we um, live in a day and age where every little bit of knowledge we want is at our fingertips you just gotta figure out where to go find it man it's so true it's like you could probably become a freaking contractor if you spend enough time just reading and then doing jobs and it's like well, I'm just, I can't. but yeah like you said all the information is there at your fingertips and yeah some of those some of those hvac like YouTube channels, I think there's one called like Trade School. Th those people know so much. Oh yeah, there's some really really good process. ones. And uh, and then some of the some people like are just installers and have like channels, and they they put some of the nicest, cleanest installs. Like like there's standards that can be set from those guys' videos. They're, I forget what their name is, but. I think they're out in New Jersey. They do like crisp. Oh, you're talking about Jeff and Mike yeah. and um, yeah, those HVAC guys. Combat, those guys. Yeah, um, they're they're set. They're set in a real standard with stuff like that, and it's mm -hmm. available for the public. Like a new installer checks out those videos and sees like, you know, how clean you can make work look. I, that's that's quite because you might not get that standard. It, no, no, a lot of places you won't because people some, don't want to take the time to do Some places can't afford to, to do all that, but I mean, yep. that's that's an excellent way to to be good at this trade is to like make things look good. Well, fellas, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, I know Wyatt, you kind of started to plug it a little bit, but where can listeners connect with you guys and you know learn more about your company? Um, so we have a website, Haskell hvac.com it's h-a-s-k-e-l-l h-v-a-c.com and then we're also haskell hvac um, on instagram and so you can see our social media and then we got like a little blog on our website and stuff so we're, we're starting that up at least just to try and get some information out there that might be helpful for people so 
So yeah, everybody go and check out Wyatt and Crawford stuff. Um, I'll also, as I build posts around the show, you guys will get some links to it. So you'll be able to find them pretty easy, but thank you so much for taking time to speak with me tonight, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for talking to the trade crew. If you're not following HVAC R and D online, please make sure to go follow me on Instagram and TikTok at HVAC.R&D. And then as the HVAC R and D podcast on LinkedIn, trade house and Facebook. If you're listening on your favorite platform right now and you're not subscribed to the show, please subscribe, follow the show, like and rate an episode, leave me a review, share me with your trade crew. Go check out the website and swag shop at HVACRD.com. If you want to work with me, you know how to do that. So have a great weekend, trade crew. I'll catch y'all soon. Thank mm-hmm. you.